Hey everybody, welcome to Altium Academy. I'm your host, Zach Peterson, and today I'm gonna show you how to get started on an RF PCB design. RF designs can be a bit different than digital. Sometimes you actually need to have a digital section in an RF design, but sometimes you're dealing with everything RF. And so you need to think about how to plan out the PCB layout and how to plan out the stack up, and of course, select materials so that you can successfully place and route all your RF components and prevent yourself from losing power as you're routing all your RF signals. So that's what we're gonna look at today. Follow along an Altium Designer if you have it. If you don't, make sure to get your free evaluation copy and follow along. Let's get started. So as you get started with your RF design, there are a few things to think about on the front end to ensure the design is gonna work properly. Number one, what frequency are you operating at? So this is probably the most important because you might be operating with a protocol like, let's say Wi-Fi, or maybe you're doing something like what we do, which is a lot of radar. So maybe you're operating at sub gigahertz signals. So you're doing something like an IoT protocol. Maybe you're operating with Bluetooth, either at 2.4 or five gigahertz. So there are all sorts of different options. And of course, you need to consider which frequency you're gonna be operating at. So that's gonna determine a lot of things. It's gonna actually influence how much loss you can expect in your RF channels. And once you know the loss that you can expect in your RF channels, that's gonna justify the material selection as well as the stack up selection that you will use. And those can help ensure that the RF board operates properly once you actually do your layout and routing. So the reason I think it's important to start thinking about this in terms of the operating frequency is, again, primarily because of losses. Now, we have an earlier video that we did looking at different types of copper and how much loss you can expect to see in your copper. However, we also looked at the dielectric loss in that particular video, so that way you can compare. And so from those numbers, you can actually see when the dielectric loss becomes excessive. And the reason that losses are important is because this is actually going to determine the size of the board, as well as the length of any routing channels in the board. Because if the board gets too large and your routing channels get too long and there's too much loss, you'll actually lose the signal. So I think it's important to do a little bit of floor planning around your particular frequency so that you can ensure that you're gonna have enough power in that signal in order to route it between your different components. So usually by this point, you actually have a block diagram, you probably have schematics, and you're gonna use those to actually then create your PCB. But it's important to actually do some floor planning and determine how much loss you're gonna be expecting in that design. So let's just look at an example for particular losses that we might expect in an RF channel. Let's just suppose that you go through the exercise that I've outlined in our earlier types of copper video, and you can actually follow along with that in the video that's linked in the description. So make sure to check that out. Let's say that you've established that your uh, losses in your PCB traces are, let's just say 0.2 dB per inch. And let's suppose then that you have a channel where you need to route from an amplifier over to, let's say a filter, and then to maybe like an SMA connector. Maybe you have an oscillator over here. So this is a pretty typical type of block diagram that you might see for an RF system. Then what you need to worry about is what is the power coming out of this amp? And then what is the power that you have to then transmit into this SMA connector? So the way we figure out the maximum length of our routing channel is to first not only look at this loss value, but we need to look at the power out and compare this to the power in. So for our system, this could be an SMA connector, could be some other component that's gonna receive this signal and do something with it. But regardless, you have a power in value that you can accept here, and that's normally gonna be specified in dBm. You've got an output value in dBm. If our power out in dBm minus our power in in dBm, that's gonna be the total amount of loss that we can accept on this particular interconnect. So this is equal to our loss in dB. So next, take your loss in decibels, divide it by, in this case, our 0.2 per inch, 
and that's going to give you the total loss that you can accept. So let's just suppose for a moment that we can accept a loss, a value of, let's say, 6 dB. So that's our total loss that we can accept between this amplifier and this SMA connector. So 6 dB in this example divided by 0 0.2, that's going to give us 30 inches. So this is actually a really long route. And typically with lower frequencies, like let's say around the Wi-Fi range on lossy materials, you might see something around this number once you get into the higher end of Wi-Fi or above that, this number can actually go up to something like a whole decibel or a few decibels per inch. And so that's really gonna limit the length of this routing path. So in this example where we said we can accept six dB of loss and 0 0.2 dB per inch total losses, then we can accept a total routing length of 30 inches. So that's gonna be the total size along this entire channel. Now, of course, there's gonna be additional losses here, let's say from the input on this filter. There could be some S11 loss. For some filters that are matched to 50 ohms, that could be like maybe a half a decibel or something like this. That's a typical value that you might see. So make sure that you account for all of this because that's gonna limit how big you can actually make your board. So the next thing that we need to do is design our stack up so that we can hit these different values. Sometimes when you start here, you may already have a stack up in mind. And then based on this type of calculation, you, de you can determine whether or not this stack up is actually gonna work and you need to change it. Or you could maybe stick with that same stack up, but then swap it for some alternative materials. So now let's look at the stack up design and see what our options are. So in looking at stack ups for RF designs, they can actually be uh, very similar to what you would use in like a digital PCB. So like a four layer board that we've talked about in the past that might have to support high speed digital. The other option is you could actually use a very thick substrate and do coplanar routing. So we've talked about that as well on two layer boards specifically with something like USB. You could also have hybrid stack ups. So a hybrid stack up mixes materials that are designed or marketed for RF PCBs operating at like the high gigahertz range with an, a standard FR4 material that you might see in other PCB substrates. So one common option, especially if you are going to have a digital section on your board, is just to go with the standard four layer stack up. So here I could have, let's say, my RF stuff on the top layer. I could then have two ground planes. So this would be GND, this would be GND. And then I could have another layer on the bottom just for digital. So this would be the type of stack up where you would wanna then say hit 50 ohm impedance on the top layer, just using microstrip routing. Here, if you needed to, you could have this signal layer also hit 50 ohm impedance with just microstrip routing. So in order to make these traces small enough, you would want to make this height here maybe 4 to 5 mil. And in making it 4 to 5 mil, that means your microstrip trace width on the top layer as well as on the bottom layer would then be about 8 to 10 mil assuming that you go with the standard DK4 uh, substrate material. Now, one thing about these materials here in this kind of standard RF and digital mixed signal type of board is these materials operating at DK equals four, these are actually gonna be perfectly fine, even up to Wi-Fi frequencies. So again, if you check out that types of copper video, we actually compared the dielectric losses and we were actually looking at a board with a dielectric constant of around four. So in that case, we saw that the losses weren't extensive. Again, just look back at the previous example that I showed as far as what you can expect for losses and routed channel lengths. Also, I'd just like to note that I've actually done boards on this type of substrate with DK equals four, and they've operated just fine. In fact, they have pretty excessive emission at Wi-Fi frequencies if you have the right antenna design. Now, one of the issues here though, is that if you're operating at a somewhat higher frequency where the skin effect and losses from copper start to become problematic, then you need to consider if you're gonna go with, say, lower profile copper on one of these thinner outer layers. You need to then decide if you're gonna go with like a Rogers or a Taconic material on the outer layers. Or what you could do is you could actually go with a different stack up altogether. So one of the alternative stack ups that you could use instead of having uh, thin outer layers is actually to have a little bit thicker outer layers and then to have a much thinner inner layer. So here you could have ground 
you can have ground, and then you can have much thicker outer layers. So for example, this might be 20 or 30 mils. This might be also 20 or 30 mils. And what that's going to do is here for these RF lines, it's going to force you to actually use a wider microstrip in order to hit that 50 ohm impedance. By using a wider microstrip, you would then not have 8 to 10 mils here. You'd actually have something much wider, something like 40 to 60 mils for a microstrip. And that's going to force you to use that wider microstrip so then you bring down the skin effect losses. If this is simply too large for your routes, and for most cases it is, what you can actually do is you can then shrink this down to a smaller value by bringing in some ground pour up on that top layer. And that ground pour up on that top layer is going to lower the impedance. And so once the impedance dips too far below 50 ohms, you then have to make this trace width smaller in order to get back to this 50 ohm target. Doing this is actually okay because this gives you some control over the trace width and allows you to balance those skin effect losses and those roughness losses with uh, the actual trace width that you need in order to route into your components. Now, if you wanted to also have controlled impedance on the bottom layer, you might be out of luck if you're just gonna do microstrips because again, here 40 to 60 mils width for microstrip is also gonna be required on the bottom layer. So if you wanted to also have controlled impedance, let's say digital on the bottom layer, then you would also need to have a coplanar strategy on the bottom layer in order to allow you to get those traces to be much narrower. So we've looked at some other stack up arrangements in other videos. You could also do a six layer stack up arrangement in the case where let's say you're doing a RF board, but it also has some digital routing on it. That's pretty common. You can go with a six layer stack up. You could even go with an eight layer stack up. Some RF boards are gonna have not only your high frequency RF, but also maybe some lower frequency RF. You could confine the lower frequency RF to an inner layer between ground planes, and then you can put your higher frequency RF on an outer layer, so that way it has lower losses. So when you're planning out where you're gonna put everything in the board and how you're gonna route everything, you have to consider a few things. First of all, a lot of RF boards have connectors. So of course, those are probably gonna be somewhere near the board edge, unless you're doing surface mounted vertical connectors, then they could essentially go anywhere. Another thing to think about is which direction are you routing? Generally, you would like to try and route things so that they are not running in these zigzaggy parallel type of routes. The other thing that you might see in RF boards is passive printed circuits. So some RF components are not actually things that you buy off the shelf. They're actually printed elements that you design into the PCB. And there are some other videos on the channel that show some examples. We'll actually link to those in the description so you can check it out. So first, I'd like to just consider some examples here where we were looking at that previous channel that we had earlier. So let's just suppose for a moment that uh, we have a connector like our SMA here and it's on the edge of the board, and we have an oscillator somewhere, and we want to get that signal from the oscillator through an amplifier and a filter all the way to the SMA. So the most straightforward path is, of course, to line up your oscillator here, then your amp, then your filter, and then straight onto the SMA. So this is really straightforward, and this works just fine because you can route straight through each of these components all the way to the SMA, and you really don't have to worry about anything. There's no other things to avoid or route around. You're good to go, it's pretty simple. Generally, with these types of systems, you're actually gonna have something else going on here that's gonna take up additional board space. And particularly for these amplifiers, these amplifiers may have a startup sequence that could require a microcontroller. There are also startup or power startup integrated circuits that will essentially delay power being delivered to different rails to these components. And all of that stuff takes up additional board space. So you could actually have power and then maybe some control components over here in these other areas of the board. So you need to consider that when you're actually planning out where you're gonna route everything in your RF board. It's important to try and floor plan everything like this so that you've really segmented stuff and you're keeping all of this stuff over here in this region and then routing directly into these components, ideally from the side if you can, Maybe this power is going into an internal layer for a plane where you can then route power with large polygons or you can cut up a ground plane if you have multiple rails. For amplifiers, this is actually really common 
RF amplifiers may need multiple rails in order to, number one, deliver all the power, but also for their digital interface so that you can actually configure the amplifier. So instead of doing everything right down the middle, sometimes it makes a little more sense to maybe put things along one of the edges. So when you put everything along one of the edges, you may have your oscillator here, your amplifier, your filter, and then out to your SMA connector. And so in that case, you may end up having to make these kind of turns or corners like this in order to get your signal over here to this particular end of this link where you have your SMA. In this case, you would wanna do your routing kind of like this, where if you can, you're able to then make these corners with your RF signals. So that way you've got a lot of space between your RF signal operating at high frequency and everything else in the board that could potentially inject noise and then interfere with this RF signal path. Keep this in mind because this is actually a form of crosstalk. If you have digital stuff going on over here in this control section, it could inject noise into your RF section, and it's a good idea to try and space all of this stuff out so that you don't have noise being coupled between these two board sections. Now you'll notice you actually just increased the length of your route here by whatever this distance is. We'll just call it D. So this additional distance could create some additional loss. And we also like to put these corners here just because the right angle trace thing can be a bit contentious. It also looks a lot prettier to have these corners here. And of course, if you're operating at really high frequencies, the reflection that you get from corners actually starts to become noticeable. So in that case, it is better to do this kind of turn here, or what you can do is actually miter these traces. You could also miter them to make these corners. So we'll be doing more videos on this type of stuff with RF design, and we'll specifically look at things like material selection, which materials should you use in your PCB stack up, some strategies for different types of designs, possibly involving multiple frequencies, and then of course we'll look at passive printed components, things like antennas, power dividers, and couplers in a Coming videos. All right, thanks everybody for tuning into this video. I hope this gives you a great intro to RF PCB design and some of the fundamental things you should think about if you have to start working in the RF domain. Make sure to hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, and last but not least, when you're gonna send in that RF stack up for review, don't forget to call your fabricator, folks.